Stan, do you watch your work? Do you go and watch mm -hmm. reruns or? I watch my work while I'm doing it. Uh, I'm incredibly involved, especially in the post-production. Um, I try not to do much on set as a producer. Obviously, as a director, I'm running the set. But when, when I get to post, uh, if I'm the producer, I like to do everything. I like to be the person who locks the cut. I like to be there in the scoring session, work with the composer, do all the visual effects, sit in the editing room, do the color correct, be there for the mix, do there for the final mix. All of that I like. I love that part of it. I was a musician in high school. I like the music. I like the whole, because I think there's three parts to making movies that people forget. And my competitors in the television movie business, I think, didn't follow this. And I think that's one of the reasons there's an Emmy on my shelf and, and not on other shelves, is that there's three very distinct parts of making a movie. The first part is the script. And that script is written to get somebody to give you the money. That's its job. The job of that script is how do we get to make the movie? The script isn't, here's the plan for the film. Here's what it should look like. Here's what it should be. That job of that piece of pay, those 120 pages, is to get someone to say, you're greenlit, go make the movie. Now you have, with the money, now you have a second period, which is the production period, which is, let's make the movie. Now, whatever's in that script may not necessarily, you may get a piece of casting that comes in that, you know what, they're better than what was there, we're gonna change that. Or we go to the location and that location doesn't exist. You may want a house that overlooks the water, but you know, on this budget, I can't afford a house that overlooks the budget, so overlooks the water, so we're gonna find another house. That's where you take what was in the script, and now you have a production script. Now you have a production plan. And now you're making the best movie you can from that part of the creative process. It's no longer the script. It's now the production script. And now you finish. Now you get to the editing room. Most of the people in the television movie business that I've worked with will use the script, and put the film together the way the script unfolded. And if there's a star, that's the star of the film. And if there's a plan for flashbacks or voiceover, that's the plan. And you put the film together like that and you give it to the network. I don't believe in that at all. I believe that now you're wrapped. Now you go into the editing room and say, okay, what's the best movie I can make from what we shot? Not from what we wrote from what we shot. There's gonna be, and it happens on every film, there's gonna be performances where you go, wow, I didn't expect that. That character actor in these five scenes steals the scene from the star. So don't cut the scene staying on the star. Cut the scene staying on that, because that's who you wanna watch. That's who lights up the screen. I've discovered actors that have gone on to big careers. They're not in, always in the, in the lead role, but you'd be a fool not to have the camera on them, even on reaction shots. The same with, with, with music. There may be a call for a certain kind of music in a scene, and you play it and go, that doesn't work. There may be a call for a visual effect, and you go, that doesn't work. So now what you gotta do is structure the film. I've had films that start in scene 25 and then flash back to start at the beginning. So you see something that's gonna happen, you don't know what it means, and you don't know where that's gonna take you, and then at some point in the film, you catch up to that scene. And I put the film together and go, that doesn't work. I don't want to see that at the beginning. It gives it away, plus the fact I'm bored. I don't know what that means. So we lop it off and we start the movie where it's supposed to start. Because that's, the film tells you what it's supposed to be. The performances tell you what the movie's supposed to be. You need to, to move it around if there are puzzle pieces sometimes. And so that third part, which is how you make the movie in post, I think is part of why my films in the television movie business have been more successful, higher rated, better reviewed than most of my competitors. And uh, you know that was why uh, my company was called Once Upon a Time, is I was a storyteller. I was gonna be a storyteller from the first day we start on the script for the last day we deliver it to the network. So this movie tells you what it's supposed to be in the edit bay, and then you work within that. It's yeah. not that script, the initial script. You don't stay Correct. too sort of like married to that one script. Correct. Interesting, okay. And di sometimes directors on a television movie, because that's what they directed, can't let go of that structure or those performances or that pacing. And so it's my job as the producer to be able to separate myself and say, okay, I have this much footage. What's the best movie I can make? It's, you know, I have all these different pieces of clay. What's the best sculpture I can make? I'm not gonna leave them as blocks. 
I'm going to mold it into something that's perfect or as perfect as can be from what I'm given. I'm not given what was in the script. We had hoped that that actor was going to be the star. Well, as it turns out, the other guy in the movie is a better performer. So I'm going to want to lean the movie that way. I'm not going to just for pride's sake, because I cast this guy as the lead and this woman as the co-lead, stay on this side. I let the movie tell me what it should be. I let the movie tell me how it should be cut, how it should be scored, how it should be mixed, how it should be color corrected. It tells you. If you pay attention, it tells you. As long as you can let go, this is the back to the coloring outside the lines question, as long as you can let go of what you wrote and what you thought you were going to shoot, you know, the happy accidents. You Stuff happens on set all the time, but those happy accidents aren't probably in the script. Those are things. When I directed Perfect Sisters with Georgie Henley and Abigail Breslin and Mira Sorvino, the best image in the entire film was not in the script. I showed up on set and Georgie was sitting in a classroom by herself and it was, and it was, they were these green desks, elementary school desks, and they were all in rows like a Kubrick movie. I mean, the geometry of the shot was amazing. And we were waiting for all of the other kids to come in because it was a classroom scene. And Georgie was sitting in the middle seat by herself. And I remember looking at her and thinking, that's the shot where she decides she's going to kill her mother. I don't have that in my script. I don't have that in my storyboard. I don't have that in my production plan. And I said to the director, shoot that. And I said to Georgie, just look down and then look up. And that's probably the most powerful moment in the film. It was not in the production plan, was not in the script. And it spoke to me. It just, all of a sudden, she was there. The, the, the symmetry of the room, everything just said, we have to shoot that. Have you ever put uh, footage on the editing timeline with, with your editor and whoever else in the room and watch the whole thing through and just sink down and go, we can't use any of this? And then, <laughs> for, I mean, you don't have to say which, which production, but and then over time, shaping it, doing, you know, maybe a couple new reshoots, it actually turned into something beautiful. Well, uh, it's interesting. As a producer, a lesson I learned, and that was maybe the hardest lesson to learn as a filmmaker, it was pretty much the hardest lesson I've ever learned, is that the hope you have for what the movie will be is never there when you look at the editor's assembly. The editor's assembly, first of all, is the editor's idea of how it should come together. And there's no score or they stuck in some, you know, temp. There's no sound effects. There's no ADR. None of what you do in that third process has happened yet. And yet I always forgot. And I finally taught myself, don't be depressed when you see the editor's assembly. It's not going to be that bad. As bad as it feels now, the movie that you thought you were going to make, you can still get there. But this isn't. And, uh, and I learned. I learned quickly, probably after five or six films, let that depression go. Don't walk in with the expectation this is going to be good. Walk in with the expectation it's not. And then I forgot it all when I became a director. And the first cut of the first movie I directed, I sobbed. I said to the editor, that's thank you so much. I walked in my car and I cried for an hour. I said, I am not a director. I did such a terrible, that is such a terrible movie. I, if I could throw it all out, I could throw it all out and start again. And then I had to call my friend Jeff Loeb, who's the best storyteller I know. Um, and he said, you've been through this before. You've done this. You've made 70 movies. Stop. You remember it as a producer. Now remember it as a director. It's just more personal now. And eventually we worked with it and worked with it and worked with it. And then I got the movie I wanted. But yeah, that was the hardest. And I still, even when I just directed an episode of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and still when I see the assembly, it's like, uh. And then you get there. 